Jana Shalakaya Chakzur Militangena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupa Terubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Hevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of uh, Bhakti Vaibhav. Srimad Bhagavatam, we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, and today we're looking at chapter number 22. Right? Yeah, chapter 22, entitled The Marriage of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. So, you'll remember. At the end of chapter 21, we heard about Swambhuvamanu coming with his good wife, Shatarupa, and their daughter, Devahuti. And Devahuti is very, very beautiful, and she's ready for marriage. And they've brought her to Kardama Muni's ashram. So Kardama Muni is a great sage, a great brahmana, Say one of the direct sons of Brahma, and Swayambhuva Manu has come there with his daughter. Kardama Muni, we heard Kardama Muni received them very nicely. He glorified Swayambhuva Manu. He praised him. Right? What is the duty of the Kshatriyas? He was praising him and said, uh, If you did not, he said, if you did not roam around the world like the brilliant sun leading a huge army, then all the moral laws governing the Varnas and Ashrams would be broken by the rogues and rascals. So Kardama Muni was appreciating the administration of Swayambhuva Manu. And then he also said, if, if you gave up all thought of the world's situation, unrighteousness would flourish. Men will hanker after money, would be unopposed. And so Kardama Muni is really appreciating how important it is to have a good government. We need to have a strong government. And then Kardama Muni concludes, he said, In spite of all this, I ask you, O valiant king, the purpose for which you have come here. Whatever it may be, we shall carry it out without reservation. Right? So, what had he come there for? Of course, he has a purpose. And so, chapter begins, Maitreya speaking. Describing the greatness of the emperor's manifold qualities and activities, the sage became silent, and the emperor, feeling mo modesty, addressed him as follows. So we're going to hear Manu speak to explain why he has come to this uh, hermitage at the banks of the Bindu Sarova, and He's come into where all these brahmanas are. There's many great sages and hermitages, and Manu has come in there. Now, he doesn't really have any business there because there's no problem from irreligion there. The people there are all very pious and religious, but he has to fulfill his own purpose. 
So Manu begins talking about how the Lord expands himself in Vedic knowledge. Lord Brahma, the personified Vedas, is created by the Lord, and the Brahmanas are full of austerity, and they're against sense gratification. And for the protection of the Brahmanas, the thousand-legged thousand Supreme Being created us, the Kshatriyas, from his thousand arms. So the Brahmanas are said to be the heart and the Kshatriyas his arms. So they're the very important parts in the society. The Brahmanas need to be protected by the Kshatriyas and the Kshatriyas need to be guided by the Brahmanas. So there's a need, a very important need for cooperation there between the Brahmanas and the Kshatriyas. And we do find that in the past, particularly here in this case, Swayambhuva Manu and Kardama, they have mutual respect for each other. Prabhupada says in the purport there, the end of text number three, the Kshatriyas are more like the whole body. Even though the whole body is bigger than the heart, the heart is more important. So the heart means the Brahmanas, and the whole body is the Kshatriyas. So relationship, within the body you need the heart. The Brahmanas have to be there. So they protect each other. And then text number four, Prabhupada's purport talks about the relationship again between the Brahmins and Kshatriyas and how they cooperate with each other and how they also take care of the other people like the Vaishyas and the Sudras. <coughs> When the Brahmanas and the Kshatriyas are doing their duty, then it's a good example for the others to also do their duty. The Brahmanas, we know in the time of, uh, before the time of Lord Buddha, there was the degradation of the social order. The Brahmanas had become degraded and corrupted. And the result was Buddhism appeared and Buddhism flourished because of the degradation of the brahmanas. So it's very important that the brahmanas have to show the right example. And the brahmanas have to show their dedication to spiritual culture. If the brahmanas are simply greedy for wealth, then that is not the good example. All right, the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, they have to cooperate nicely. The Brahmanas have to enlighten the Kshatriyas. And when there's this cooperation between the different Varnas, when the Brahmins and Kshatriyas, when they can all cooperate together, then that's very pleasing to Lord Krishna. You can see in the history of the world that when the Brahmanas became degraded, then the Kshatriyas took over. The Kshatriyas moved the Brahmanas out of power. The Brahmanas were ruling, but then the Kshatriyas took over. And the Kshatriyas, without the guidance of the Brahmanas, they soon lost their power and became unqualified. And you, you have so many different revolutions took place against the kings. For example, uh, there was a French revolution. When Prabhupada went to France, he said, your country is famous for revolution. And Prabhupada said to him, this is Krishna consciousness, this is a spiritual revolution. 
so that they threw out the, the king, the, the queens, the royal family, they were, they were all beheaded and some of them ran off, they managed to escape to England. But they used to have queen, the queen, the royal family in France. And then we know uh, there was a similar thing in Russia. There was the Tsar of Russia. And in China, there was the emperor. They had the last emperor. And in India also, there were, used to be so many kings. And the government gradually took away all the power and all the wealth of the kings. Because they didn't do anything really good. And then what happened? The Vaishyas took over. And you got different Vaishyas, and particularly you look in the West, you see that in order to go into politics in somewhere like USA, you have to be a very wealthy Vaishya. Otherwise you cannot possibly take part in politics there. You have to be really, really wealthy in order to uh, canvas for support. But the Vaishyas also get kicked over by the Sudras, and that's where communism comes in. The communist movement is a movement of Sudras, the, the workers, the laborers, they take over. And so you, you have, we see in the world, there's countries which are still communist today. I think five countries in the world are communist today. Now there's China, North Korea, and there's Laos, there's Cuba, uh, Vietnam, these countries, they're all communist. It means the movement of the Sudras. They have no Kshatriyas, they have no Vaishyas, they have no Brahmins. It's just a movement of the workers. Everything belongs to the state. So Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness is spiritual communism. Everything belongs to Krishna. All right, so Manu is speaking like this, describing the relationship. And he's very happy to have met Kardama Muni. He says, now all my doubts have been resolved simply by meeting you. You have clearly explained the duty of a king who desires to protect his subjects. And then Prabhupada writes in the purport, pur this purport is very important for us as devotees, uh, Prabhupada writes in the purport about the importance of getting the association of a saintly person. Just like Manu is appreciating his good fortune in meeting Kardama, so Prabhupada says, Lord Chaitanya also taught us the importance of getting association from a saintly person. And Prabhupada quotes, he even for a moment, right, the famous verse, Lava Matra, Lava Matra, for a moment of a second, then you can get all perfection. And Prabhupada writes about his own experience in the purport, so this is very much mood and mission. If you're making a note, then you can mark here, this is Prabhupada's mood and mission which is being described. And Prabhupada describes here, once we had the opportunity to meet Vishnu Pad, Sri Srimad Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Goswami Maharaj. And on first sight, he requested this humble self to preach his message in the Western countries. There was no preparation for this, but somehow or other he desired it. And by his grace, we are now engaged in executing his order, which has given us a transcendental occupation and has saved and liberated us from the occupation of material activities. So can you think of some other examples in the scriptures about how a, 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 someone got the association of a saintly person and it transformed their life? Uh, well, you know, Narada Muni was a spiritual master of Vyasadeva. Yeah. You know, 
Narada Muni, he was uh, serving the devotees, the sages. Yes. Right, he was serving the sages, right? He took the association of the sages and that <coughs> gave him some impetus towards spiritual life. Yeah? <coughs> Even though he was a young boy and he didn't really know very much, but he took advantage of their association. Uh, got the association of Narad Muni Who? and uh, Prachinabari. Prachinabari? Yeah. Associated with Narad Muni and uh, he, his life was changed. Right. He was, he was doing Karmakandya Yagya. Right. He, he was doing all the animal sacrifices. Yes. And Narada Muni influenced him, instructed him. Talk, well, how did Narada Muni preach to him? He showed those uh, animals, those who were killed, that they are waiting for you to kill yours. That's why he um, stopped that uh, sacrifice and uh, he took to this uh, devotional service. Okay. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Well, well, the question is, uh, who became devotee with the association of sages? Yes. So I can give example. Of Prahlad Maharaj, Dhruv Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj. Murari, yeah, Murari. My daughter is saying, Murari the hunter. Murari the hunter. Yeah. 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 There are many examples, right? We see, and what a, you know, it, it, the association can be very brief. It doesn't have to be for a long time. You know, people often complain they don't get enough association, they don't get enough time from their teachers or from their spiritual teachers and they say want more association. But according to scripture, even one moment of association is sufficient. So one moment can change a person's heart. Can you think of some examples where very quickly, immediately, the person was changed? Ah, Bilva Mango. Can you tell us more what happened? Bilva Mango had been to the heavenly planet and he just saw it in the war in favor of the demigods. And whenever he was uh, proposing to come, uh, return to this. Uh, metal world, which was his place of abode, by the time, most of the time, he had already, uh, he had already consumed, that means most of the time had been exhausted. There was very few time in his life, and uh, he uh, just utilized that time, transformed himself to spiritual world. Who was this? Vila Thakur. Bilva Mango Thakur? Yeah. No, I don't think that's Bilva Mango Thakur. That's Gadvanga Maharaj. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Khatanga Maharaj, yeah. Gadvanga Maharaj. Oh, yeah. Bilva Mango Thakur is a different case, right? Who knows about yeah. Bilva Mango Thakur? Yes, Maharaj. He, he was, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, prostitute. He was very much attached to a prostitute. Oh. And Chintamani. Chintamani, yeah. And what did she say to him? That uh, the love, of, uh, love and affection you have for me, for this uh, material body, if this affection is for the Lord, then uh, you would have been uh, elevated to a, <laughs> to, to a higher extent, like that. Okay, yes, right. Yeah. Material body. If you only had this, if only had the same enthusiasm for Lord Krishna. You're so eager to come to be with me. It was such a terrible night, a storm and everything, but still Bhuva Mango took all kinds of risks. He crossed the river and he crossed over the wall and 
He got there and he's so eager to be with Chintamani. And she said to him, if only you had the same eagerness to be with Krishna. And then Bilva Mango thought, Krishna, right? It just somehow it entered into his heart. And there was just a change. And then he turned around and he decided he must go to Vrindavan to be with Krishna. Mm -hmm. And we see also the four Kumaras. The four Kumaras, when they entered into the spiritual world, what happened? Uh, the the Sharavinda, Nayana, the Padaravinda, like that, that person there. There was a transformation. Yeah. Right. The Lord came, and the aroma yeah. of the Tulsi from the lotus feet of the Lord had entered the nostrils of the four Kumaras. And their ex what they experienced a change in their heart and in their mind. They became devotees, just like that. Took only took a moment, right? So, there are many instances that people come and they they see the deities immediately. They feel the change. All right. So association with the devotees very powerful. And if one can associate with the Supreme Lord, of course, that's also very, very powerful. All right. So, Kardama Muni, uh, uh, rather, Swayam Bhuvamanu is glorifying Kardama Muni, and he's telling him why he has come there. He said, it's my good fortune I've been able to see you, for you cannot easily be seen by persons who have not subdued the mind or controlled the senses. I am all the more fortunate to have touched with my head the blessed dust of your feet. Now Swayam Bhuvamanu is the emperor, the emperor of the world, and he is glorifying Kardama Muni like this. You can understand something of the spiritual position of Swayambhuva Manu, that to be, ma to be a Manu, Swayambhuva Manu is the first Manu in the day of Brahma. So he's very advanced spiritually and he's very humble. He takes the dust from the feet of Kardama Muni on his head and he considers himself to be very fortunate. So to get the association of the Mahatmas, that is the goal of life. But he said, Swayambhuva said, it's not easy to meet such people unless you've subdued the mind or controlled the senses. The Mahatmas, they don't, people won't advertise themselves as Mahatmas. They're not going to declare themselves as Mahatmas. All right, so the common man, they don't get that opportunity. Common man cannot rise to the topmost stage of spiritual perfection simply by following rituals and religious principles. How can a common man make advancement? And Prabhupada said, he has to take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and work under his direction faithfully and sincerely, then he can become perfect without a doubt. Uh, so we, we see similarly in the Bhagavad Gita, we see Arjuna surrendering to Lord Krishna, right? Arjuna, what was Arjuna's situation prior to his surrender to Krishna? He was not uh, listening to Lord Krishna's uh, order or instructions. 
Well, he was, you say he was not listening to, Lord Krishna hadn't begun to give him any instructions. Before Arjuna surrendered, before Arjuna surrendered, Krishna had not given him any instructions. To fight, to fight. Lord Krishna hadn't told him to fight. He was confused whether to fight or not fight. Yes. What's the verse? What's the verse from Bhagavad Gita? Arjuna is saying he's confused about his duty. Yes, that's the verse. Every one of you should know these verses. Bhakti Vaibhav students, you've already studied Bhakti Shastri. You have to remember all these verses from Bhakti Shastri. You have to remember these things. Very important. Otherwise, how will you preach? So, Arjuna was confused about his duty, so he surrendered to Krishna. And then Krishna began to instruct him. Once he had surrendered. Right? He said, now I am your disciple, a soul surrendered unto you, please instruct me. So then Krishna begins. And, well, first of all, even before he begins, Krishna tests him. He said, are you sure? He said, you know, we are friends. How can, I, how can I be your teacher and you be my student? We are friends. We are equals. He tests him a little bit. That's also there in accepting the spiritual teacher. Narada Muni tested Dhruva Maharaj. Oh, you're too young. Go home. Come back when you're grown up. The spiritual master, the Mahatmas, they're not going to give their mercy, their blessings so cheaply. They will hide themselves. They will disguise themselves. They will appear like ordinary people. So, Swain Bhuva Manu continues, text number seven. I have fortunately been instructed by you. This great favor has been bestowed upon me. I thank God that I have listened with open ears to your pure words. So the importance of hearing from the great souls, we have to hear from them. Uh, in the purport, I've mapped a little section. It is especially mentioned here that one should be very inquisitive to hear with open ears from the authorized source of the bona fide spiritual master. Where is this described in the Bhagavad Gita? One should be very inquisitive. Right, yes. Right. Inquire submissively. And then Prabhupada said, the favor of the spiritual master is not received through any other part of the body but the ears. You want the favor of the spiritual master, it's not he pats you on the head. It's not, he, but the favor is when he speaks, when he, from his words, he, his words enter into your ears, into your heart. That is the blessing, that is the real favor of the spiritual teacher. Okay. All right, so Prabhupada talks a lot about the, the duties of the devotee, how they have to be engaged in different ways in Krishna consciousness. If somebody's in the deity room, somebody's editing, somebody's preaching, somebody's cooking, all different departments. But they're all engaged under the direction of the spiritual teacher. And the spiritual teacher understands the ability of different devotees and he will engage them accordingly. In the same way, Arjuna is a military man and he's engaged by Krishna to use his military skills. 
for the service of Lord Krishna. And then we hear about Vayavasayatmika Buddhi, that full faith in the order of the spiritual master, to carry out the order of the spiritual master. Right? How is that verse significant for devotees in Krishna consciousness? Why is it so important? Vayavasayatmika Buddhi Ekeha Kurunandana. It's a very important verse for all of us as devotees. Why? The Guru plays Krishna is clean. And Guru is a fire medium. What was the particular significance? How did it affect Prabhupada? Prabhupada, he always remembered the instruction given by his spiritual master. Bhaktisthana Shri Thakur, and he always referred this verse. Yes, Prabhupada read that purport to this verse by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur described there that the goal of life is to follow the order of the spiritual master that if we don't follow the order of the spiritual master, then our life is meaningless. So Srila Prabhupada reflected on his own position and his duty to his own spiritual master. And then he went to the West to preach. All right, so Swayam Bhuva Manu is a very humble soul. Now he's coming to the real point of his purpose in coming there. And he says, uh, this is text number nine. He says, uh, My daughter, the sister of Priyavrat and Uttanapad, right? two great souls, just to let Kardama Muni know that this girl is. You know, she's coming from a very good family because her two brothers are very well known, Priyavrat Uttanapad, and she's seeking a suitable husband in terms of age, character, and good qualities. So, very important, at the time of marriage, there, sh there has to be this compatibility between the two, that the husband and the bride and the groom, or the, the people who are being proposed for marriage, they should be compatible to each other in terms of age, character, and good qualities, similar qualities. So Devahuti by saying that she's the sister of Priyavrat and Uttanapad, this tells Kadama Muni something about the qualities of this girl, Devahuti, that how qualified she must be, that her brothers are so great, that she must also be qualified. Plus the fact that her father is Swayambhuva Manu as well. So she's not just any ordinary girl. But she's a very special woman and she wants to find a man who is suitable, who will make a suitable companion for her in terms of age, character and good qualities. So that's the job of the father. Actually, it's the duty of the father who has to find such a person who will make a suitable husband for his daughter. Traditionally, anyway, in Vedic culture, it would be like that, that the father would take... Of course, you, we see, for example, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he got married. It was there, there were people who arranged, right? There was other ladies who would come and say, you know, your son will make a very good husband for this girl, like that. Matchmakers, these kind of people. 
So that's common also. But anyway, here in the Vedic times, it was the duty of the father. But the father had also been helped by Narada Muni, because Narada Muni had gone there to the palace of Swayambhuva Manu. And Narada Muni had been talking to Devahuti and telling her about this man, Kardama Muni. That's, so that's mentioned in text number 10, that the moment she heard from the sage Narada of your noble character, learning, beautiful appearance, youth and other virtues, she fixed her mind upon you. So, we learn something about the compatibility. They talk about Kadama's beautiful appearance. And so, appearance that certainly seems to play a part in it. There should be some mutual attraction there. Not only age, character and qualities, there must be also that kind of uh, physical attraction. It's described he's, he's youthful, and so that's good. The, the girl is also youthful. And uh, he's also learned, of course, as a, as a brahmana, a noble character. Of course, he's of the most noble character. So accepting a girl from the family of Manu, the, the man should be very noble in character. So Prabhupada talks about how the father arranged this. Devahuti heard about Kadama Muni from Narada Muni, and now she and then she tells her father, and so her father brings her to the ashram of Kadama Muni. And Kadama Muni was he ready for this? Was this a great surprise for him? Lord had already said this point to me. Right. The Lord had already told him, right? When Kardama Muni was doing his meditation, the Lord had appeared to him, and the Lord had told him in a few days, this girl was coming, and she is a suitable wife for you. And the Lord understood that Kardama Muni wanted to marry. So why did Kardama Muni want to marry? When he'd been a brahmachari for 10,000 years? It's the order of his father, Brahma, to create present. Right. He's obedient to the order of his father. So, uh, in the purport text 10, Prabhupada said, hearing from an authority is a better experience than gaining personal understanding. She heard from Narada Muni that Kardama Muni was just fit to be her husband. Therefore, she became fixed in her heart that she would marry him. And she expressed her desire to her father, who therefore brought her before him. So text 11, Kardama tells, and he asked Kardama and we said, please accept her. For I offer her with faith, and she is in every respect fit to be your wife and take charge of your household duties. So the duty of a wife is described. The, the duty of a wife, and we can also understand something of the duty of a husband. It's not that only the duty is on the wife. The husband also has a responsibility. He also has a part to live up to the character so that his wife will have proper respect for him. So that in this way, the husband and wife, they can both be a good example for each other. So Prabhupada said, it's the duty of the wife to take charge of household affairs and not to compete with her husband. 
not to compete with her husband. Now, th this is very difficult, of course, you know, in, present, in the modern times, we find a lot of women are working, they go out to work, and sometimes also it happens that women earn more than the men. And then it becomes, you know, like, you know, the woman, her position becomes more prominent because she's earning more than the man. So the husband comes home from work and the wife is also coming home from work. Who's going to cook? <laughs> Who should cook? You know, in China, in China they have a saying because, you know, in China they're very fond of uh, women also going to work. So they have a saying, man and women are equal. They say both are equal. So if the man comes home first, the man will cook. And if the woman is home first, then she will cook. But often they're both home late and they eat outside. They don't cook. <laughs> so these kind of things. You know, it's so common nowadays, people in uh, parts of the world, and particularly in Asia, people all want to go out and eat. They don't like to cook anymore. They think, oh, what a drudgery, cooking, you know, and everything is bought outside, go outside to eat. The whole family go out to eat. And you get homes, like in America nowadays, when they build houses, they don't put a kitchen. They don't, they don't think, well, nobody wants a kitchen. Everybody just goes out to eat. So this is uh, Kali Yuga. So the women is the woman's working, the husband's working. Nobody cooks; they eat outside every day. It's not a very stimulate, not a very good situation. Shouldn't really be like that. So it's actually the duty of the wife to take charge of the household affairs and to serve her husband. And Prabhupada said, the household duty of a man is not to satisfy sense gratification, but to remain with a wife and children, and at the same time attain advancement in spiritual life. So certainly in householder life we can advance. The Grihasta Ashram. Ashram is a place for spiritual advancement. So it's not that because I'm a, in family life I'm fallen, you can make great advancement in family life. But there has to be that cooperation. So the duty of the wife is to help her husband and to serve her husband. And the husband's duty is to be worthy of her service. Text number 12, to deny an offering that has come of itself is not recommended, is not commendable, even for one absolutely free from all attachment, much less one addicted to sensual pleasure. So Kadama Muni is saying, your desire, you desire a suitable wife like my daughter, and she is now present before you. You should not reject the fulfillment of your prayer. You should accept my daughter. So we see sometimes in Mahabharata, for example, we do see some men who refused. When suitable girls came for marriage, they refused. Can you think of some instances where the girl was refused? Strike and his mother? Bishma. Bishma, right. Yeah, that's an example we would immediately think of, right? That Bishma was supposed to, that one girl, what was her name? Um, yeah, Amba. Amba, yeah, Amba. Yeah. That she, well, first of all, she said that I'm already engaged to marry. She said, I can't marry your brother. Bhishma Dev had brought the three girls to marry uh, Vichitravirya, his brother. 
But Amba said, you know, I'm already engaged to marry. So then Bhishma told her, oh, then you better go back and get married. But when she went back, then the husband said, no. The man said, no, I don't want you anymore. You're touched by another man. I won't, I'm not going to accept you. So she came back to Bhishma and she said, you have to accept me. He won't accept me anymore because you touched me, you've taken me, you've touched me. So he doesn't want me anymore. But Bhishma said, no, I cannot. I vowed, Brahmachari. And then, of course, she went to Parasaram, and then Parasaram tried to convince Bhishma, and even they fought, but Parasaram couldn't convince Bhishma. And so Bhishma kept his Brahmachari, and Amba, she did penances and austerities, and she came back in a form to help to kill Bhishma. Right? Something like that. There's some plot there that she took her birth. Amba came back in the form of, what was his name? Sakuni. Sukandi. Sukandi. Sukandi, right. And then whenever Sukandi came in front of Bhishma, then Bhishma understood this is Amba and he wouldn't fight. And that was when they killed Bhishma. Hmm. Okay, so that's Mahabharata. So we don't accept a suitably qualified woman when she comes. Uh, one who rejects an offering, which comes of its own accord, and later begs a boon from a miser, loses his reputation and his pride is humbled by the neglectful behavior of others. So Prabhupada writes very interesting here in the purport, he says, A boy should not go to the girl's father and ask for the hand of his daughter in marriage. That is considered to be humbling one's respectable position. Right? If the boy has to go and ask for the girl, that's considered to be humbling. It's a girl who should come with her father to ask the boy. Now it's different in different places. You know, I know in China it's a custom the boy has to come and ask for the girl. And if you want the girl, you have to pay. You have to give a dowry to the girl's father. To get the wife, you have to pay. And similarly in Africa, you want a wife, you have to pay the girl's fa father to get the girl to be your husband, your wife. The man has to pay. In India, the girl's family pay the man. They give a dowry to the man. But in other countries, it's different. The girl is considered more important. And so here it says the boy shouldn't go to the girl's father. And then it's mentioned, Swayambhuva Manu wanted to convince Kardama Muni since he knew the sage wanted to marry a suitable girl. I am offering just such a suitable wife. Do not reject the offer or else, because you are in need of a wife, you will have to, you will have to ask for such a wife from someone else who may not behave with you so well. In that case, your position will be humbled. <laughs> so, like the Prabhupada is giving many arguments why Kardama Muni has to accept this offer. You could understand there may be some doubt in the mind of Kardama Muni, first of all, you know, that he's a poor Brahmana and she's coming from a very wealthy family. So you bring a rich girl into a poor family, then it's very difficult for her. That's why generally they should be equally matched. The, you know, we see in India today it's common that one somebody from a business family will marry another person from a business family. They should come from a similar level of economic status. If the girl's very rich, from a very rich family, and she marries in a poor man, 
then it will be very difficult for her, very hard. Because she's used to comforts and luxury. So Kardama may have some doubts about, should I marry this girl, you know? And another problem is that she's very beautiful. So you don't really want a woman <coughs> to be so beautiful. It said that the beautiful woman is the greatest enemy of the man, particularly a man's an endeavouring transcendentalist. You don't want to have a woman who is too beautiful. It becomes a, too, too big a problem, just being around such a beautiful woman. Uh, Prabhupada also said, when he was married, he said he didn't like his wife. But Prabhupada's father said, that's good. He said, later on in life, that will be good for you. That will make it easier to be detached. But if the wife is very beautiful, then certainly we can become uh, overwhelmed by the situation. At the end of the purport, text number 13, Prabhupada said, Therefore, in offering one's daughter to a person, <coughs> the culture and quality are counted as prominent, not wealth or any other material consideration. Now, is that true? When you arrange your marriage, you don't consider wealth? You should, but it's just not. Uh, hmm? You, you should consider wealth, but it's just not. Hare Krishna? We do consider Prabhupada. Huh? We, we do consider uh, because uh, we need to be, I mean, woman needs to be supported. Yes, right. You know, some young men sometimes complain to me that, you know, when they look for a suitable, when they look for a woman to marry, the woman wants to know how much money have you got? Do you have a car? Will we have our own house? You know, I don't want to stay with your parents and things like this, you know. Mm. So, yes. Yeah, you know, certainly a woman's going to get married, she's going to want children, and she wants to know that her children can be supported, they can be properly looked after and educated and things. So in some ways certainly wealth is important, isn't it? But it's not... Yeah, my Lord, one more point uh, I'd like to make in this, uh, that if um, if they're not well off, if the wife is not well off, I mean, getting married to a person who is well off, then again, that there comes the situation where she has to work. And then that comes a situ situation which we are facing in modern world, that equality, because we are both working, I'm also contributing, so who's going to cook, as you were saying. So that comes because um, there is not enough money to support the wife without work. That's what I think. Uh -huh. Isn't it so? Right. Yes, of course. The, the, sometimes the wife thinks, you know, m the money is actually enough, but the wife wants to live at a higher standard. Sometimes, yeah, is, sometimes the problem is with the wife, that she wants to live on a higher standard than what the husband's actually able to offer the wife. So the wife thinks, I, sh I have to go to work. But they could live at a lower standard without the wife working. Right? So there are arguments both for and against it. It's a difficult situation. We definitely understand. It's not easy to arrange marriages and to organize these things. It's difficult. 
All right, so it's for Tzvayim Bhuva Manu. Uh, it says to Kodama Muni, I, he said, I heard you were prepared to marry. So you hadn't taken a vow, celibacy. So why not accept this girl? And Prabhupada explains there's two kinds of brahmacharis. You've got the nice tikka brahmachari who, you know, they're lifetime celibate. And the other brahmachari is called upa, upa kurvana. Upa kurvana brahmachari. And so he's a brahmachari who takes the vow of celibacy up to a certain age. Now, generally, the proper age to marry should be like, you know, brahmachari, first 25 years. First 25 years spent in brahmachari life, and then can enter into grihasta life. Okay? If you wait too long, you get too old, it's not very easy to adjust to married life. But if man is like 25, and ideally, the woman should be younger than the man. When the woman is a little older than the man, then that can be also difficult. Generally, we see the women mature much earlier than the men. Young, young girls at the age of 12 are already mature ladies, but 12-year-old boys are not mature. The boys mature about 15, 16. So that's generally why it's easier for the boy to be, the man, to, the, she should be a little older than the woman. All right, so Kadama Muni has made, Aswam Bhuvamanu has made his offer to K K Kadama and he's told him, you never, you've not made a vow of lifelong celibacy, so take my daughter. So text uh, 15, we have Kadama replying to Aswam Bhuvamanu. He said, yeah, I have a desire to marry. Your daughter is not married and she's not given her word to anyone. So, yeah, all right, <laughs> let's get married, I'll marry her. And he's happy. Mm. The father was willing and the daughter was qualified. She had never offered her heart to anyone else. So that's important. Sometimes, you know, you get young girls, they, sometimes marriage is going to be arranged and sometimes before they get married, sometimes they, they already realize they're not going to work and they can't get along and they cancel the marriage. And so that's a big disturbance. You know, the girl was thinking I was going to marry this boy and then suddenly then they break up and they're not going to marry and then the girl becomes very disturbed because she was already in some sense she's giving her heart to that man. So. That's a problem. So Kadama Muni is speaking about, he said, your daughter has a desire for marriage. And so who would not accept her? She's so beautiful. And he describes about her beauty. Yeah, and she's a very beautiful woman. She beautifies her ornaments. And he even, he, he's, he's heard about her somehow. Text 17 describes uh, that he heard about her. He said, I have heard that Vishvavasu, the great Gandharva, fell from his aeroplane after seeing your daughter playing with a ball on the roof of the palace. <laughs> so she was so beautiful. Vishvavasu, one of the Gandharvas, he fell from his aeroplane just seeing her beauty. Oh my goodness, that was very beautiful. Just like Rukmini, when Rukmini came for marriage, she was so beautiful that people were fainting just seeing her. So Kadarma Muni said, what wise man would not welcome her? She has come of her own accord to seek my hand. So he's, he's very happy, he's very pleased to take her. I shall accept this chaste girl 
as my wife. But now, text, 20, text 19, Kardama Muni has a condition. He said, I will accept her as my wife on the condition that after she bears semen from my body, I shall accept the life of devotional service accepted by the most perfect human beings. That process was described by Lord Vishnu. It is free from envy. So, Kadama Muni is agreeing to marry, but with conditions that I'm going to renounce later on. After she accepts the semen from my body, then I will renounce. And then, in the purport, Prabhupada talks about children, Kardama Muni's desire to have children, and Prabhupada talks that the child would be a ray of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One should beget a child who can perform the duties of Vishnu. Otherwise, there's no need to have children. There are two kinds of children, born of good fathers, one is educated in Krishna consciousness so that he can be delivered from the clutches of Maya in this very life, and the other is a ray of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and teaches the world the ultimate goal of life. And then later on in the purport, Prabhupada said, unless one can train a child for liberation in that life, there's no need to marry or produce children. So, two kinds of children. One child, we should, when, when the child is born, the husband and wife, they should think that this child will not take birth again in the material world. This will be their last birth. We sh they should think like that. They should have a child with such good qualities that the child will not take birth again, that this birth will be their very last birth before they go back to Godhead. And the other child should be a ray of Vishnu. If you can have a child who is an incarnation of Godhead, then that's even better. So this is, uh, this is successful householder life. This is successful family planning. Talk about family planning, right? This is family planning, having very special children. And then the father, later on, is going to take sannyas. Paramahamsa is going to go off and be a sannyasi. What are these two kinds of children basically? But in the, the difference, one will be Krishna conscious, or one category and other category will teach, will preach Krishna consciousness. Approximately, both the kinds are same, or there is some difference? Yeah, there's some difference here, right. You know, it's mentioned. One is a ray of Vishnu, a ray of the Supreme Lord, teaches the world the ultimate goal of life. Just, we say Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, he was a ray of Vishnu. And we, Lord Kapila, Lord Kapila Muni, he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He taught the world the ultimate goal of life. So you get incarnations of God coming. Kapila Muni appeared in the semen of Kardama Muni. And other children, they can be delivered by born of good fathers, educated in Krishna consciousness. You see, if the parents will educate their children in Krishna consciousness, then they can be delivered from Maya. So, the duty of the parents is there. They have to produce good children. And then when the child is born, then they have to train them and educate them. Just like Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he trained his children. He trained them to preach. 
He trained Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati when he was a young boy. He'd already memorized the Bhagavad Gita. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur gave him the Shringa Mantra, he gave him his Japa beads to chant on and everything. So this is the training, this is the, this kind of birth, very important. And Prabhupada told us also, he learned everything, everything he learned from his spiritual master, he'd already learned from his own father. His own father taught him. Yeah, his own father arranged for him to play the Madanga, all of these things. He said, my father did not want me to be a, a worldly man. And there was even talk that Prabhupada should go to London and be a lawyer, but his father said, no, I don't want my son to become a worldly person. So Prabhupada said, he, he, I learned everything from my father, except printing books. He said, that I learned from my Guru Maharaj. So difference there. Yeah? Thank you. Okay. Maharaj, uh, I have uh, uh, one question. So this also depends on the children, right? Uh, parents, they can teach the kids, but children should have their karma also, their, you know, sukriti to take Krishna consciousness from the beginning. Um, so I was talking about my kid to uh, a, a, another uh, senior devotee of Prabhupada and he was saying that no, don't push them too much to Krishna consciousness. You do whatever you, you are doing, like serving Krishna, going to temple, teaching them Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and all. And uh, you never know their their uh, demigods who have come here. Uh, so they will automatically have their awakening. There are many devotees who actually had awakening, even so many incidences I heard, real life incidences, who did not show any, um, any devotee symptoms in the beginning. But later on, all of a sudden, they become such a, you know, uh, strict brahmachari and they started serving in Mayapur and all, all those stories I heard. So, isn't that, you know, what we all bring in our karma or uh, how do we do it? Yes, <coughs> but yes, you could say there's certainly karma there, the children. Mm, yeah, we want to encourage them, you know, the fact that they're born in a devotee family is an advantage for them because they see the parents, they see the parents cooking and worshipping and studying and chanting. And so that example is there. That's very important, that the children see the example from their parents. Now Bhaktivinoda Thakur had several children. I think he had like, what, 13 children or something? But, you know, they didn't all become great devotees. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, Dharta, Bhimal Prasad, he was a, he became very, he was the fourth child. Mm. So it, it's going to be different for different children. Some children will take it, will take more interest than others. But certainly you want to give the opportunity that the children can see that it's going on. Your own example is there. And that should be an, an inspiration to them. They'll remember that. And as you say, there are many examples later on, after some time, you know. But some people, some children, they, they just want to, they want to know more about the world. They want to see the world more. And they're not ready to just simply give themselves up to Krishna. It's different for different children. Yes, Maharaj. And another uh, um, thing I was thinking that Kadama Muni, why did he say that he will, after uh, begetting children, he will immediately take sannyas? Because sannyas in Varnashram, uh, age is already fixed, right? So it should be as per 50 years, right? Not as per, okay, I, I gave you one son and that's it. I'll take 
Well, you remember Kardama Muni's appearing in the Satya Yuga. He'd already spent 10,000 years doing uh, Astanga Yoga, doing meditation. <laughs> so I don't know quite, I don't quite know what age he is when he takes sannyas. And it's, it's a, so, so, for Satya Yuga, what is the age for taking sannyas? Huh? Isn't that how old is for Sati Yuga, no. what is the age of um, taking sannyas? Like in Kali Yuga, it says that in, during uh, when you are 50 years old, you have to take sannyas. Havana Prastha. Havana Prastha, you take it, supposed to take it 50. Sannyas, it, it doesn't say what Yeah, Havana Prastha. So, so in Sati yes. Yuga, uh, uh, well, the average life is a hundred thousand years, right? They live one lakh. So, uh, at what age do they take? Do they renounce? I don't know. Uh, we're not given any real details about the years, but we did hear that Kadama Muni enjoyed for many years. He travelled with Devahuti for many years. They travelled to many different places and enjoyed heavenly pleasures and before he, they eventually came back and she gave birth and then the Lord came as their son and then with the Lord coming as their son then Kardama Muni goes. So with the, pre okay, with the presence of the son that was the point that was when came time for Kardama to go because he thought now you have a son the son is taking care of you, I not need it anymore. And so the son grew up, right? Uh, or if the son is baby, then because um, in Vanaprastha, also the son has to be old enough to take care of mom for the father to go away, right? Yes, but remember, these are not ordinary children. You know, they, they take birth, they immediately grow. And the, you know, they don't, it doesn't, it's not like they have to go through childhood like what we know it. They're not ordinary children. Oh. And the nine daughters, you know, nine daughters, they took birth immediately. And uh, Kadama Muni expanded himself into nine, nine forms and conceived a daughter in each, by each form. <laughs> Very special situations. And also in Satya Yuga, the sannyas is different from sannyas as we know it today. In the Kali Yuga, sannyas is more for preaching and propaganda work. But in the Satya Yuga, that's not sannyas. In the Satya, Satya Yuga, the sannyas is much more renunciation, being away from the world, living in the forest. Not like sannyas as we know it in Kali Yuga. The art sannyas in Kali Yuga is just more preaching and propaganda work. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Maharaj, can I ask one question? Yeah, okay, Prima. <clears throat> um, I find this whole uh, Kardana Muni's life very confusing because. Uh, you know, he sees, meets Lord Vishnu, um, but then it says he has a material desire, but then we say his material desire was the order of his father. And then later on, you know, he marries, he gives, uh, he says he wants to have children, but when the children are born, he wants to leave home, and his son is the personality of Godhead. So it's full of uh, contradictions, it seems. Well, we have to understand that, yeah, he, the Lord appeared as his son, but he leaves home because he has to show the example of spirit, you know, the, the renunciation has to be there. You cannot just stay at home because the Lord is there. The Lord is there as his son. And so he knows the Lord is, as his son is going to take care of his wife. So he's free from that responsibility. So he did his duty as a husband and as a father. So he's able to go. He has to show the example. And he, 
previously he had already made that promise that after we have a son, then I will leave. So he has to keep his word. But I don't quite understand why it says he had a desire to have children, but then he didn't want to stay around for them. It seems a little unusual. Well, it was his duty as a, as a, the Brahma wanted him to do the work of Prajapati, to produce children. So he did that, he produced the children. And then, of course, the girls, immediately they're married, they're taken by the sons of Brahma for wives. They're all immediately married, the girls are there, they go off with their husbands. So, you know, he's, he's not really involved. And the, the children, are, they're not children, they grow up immediately. They take birth immediately, they grow up immediately. It's not like as we think of it, you know, that, oh, she gets pregnant and she carries a child in her womb for so many months and then the baby comes and and you have a baby, they have to take up, the bring up the baby. No, th well, these were very special pastimes. And the children who were born also very special. They take birth immediately and they're grown up very quickly, no time, it's not, there's no problem there. And so it's not like, you know, we think, oh, my children, they need me. <laughs> no. These, these children, they didn't need, they didn't need Kardama. Although, although they had children, it was not ordinary, it wasn't like family life as we know it. Mm. We have to understand it and how, how it's a very, very elevated form of family life. So one other question is that Kardama Muni, when he meets uh, Swambhu Bhamanu, is very elevated spiritually. But is it anywhere said who his spiritual master is, or we just assume it's Brahma? Kardama Muni? Yes. He's, yes. Well, yeah. yes. He's the direct son of Brahma. Yes. He's the direct son of Brahma. And who is his spiritual master? He, he must, it must be Brahma, yeah, it must have been. He learned everything from Brahma. Just like Narada Muni, who is the spiritual master of Narada Muni? Lord Brahma. And so similar, Kardama also. Spiritual master, it doesn't mean that they had to spend a lot of time together. doesn't mean that they, he had to, that Brahma had to come and give class to him every day and answer all his questions and doubts and train him in there. But uh, simply by taking birth, by his birth from the mind of Brahma, then he's already endowed with so many spiritual qualities. I think we have, have to understand it in that way, that we're, we're not told about Kardama, but he's very much conversant with what's required in the Vedic way of life. He's respectful to the Vedic system, he honors Swain Bhuva Manu, and uh, he's ready to follow the order of his father. And then later on he's going to renounce and go off into the forest instead of renunciate. And so he's very much following the Vedic culture. How does he know about the Vedic culture? Well, he's been living in the ashram. He's been living there in that banks of the Bindus are over there 10,000 years. And there are many hermitages there. There's many other great sages and yogis also there. So he sees their example also, association. And the process in the Satya Yuga was meditation. It was just the done thing that people would sit and meditate. And Kardama Muni did it. Thank you.
All right, we'll go ahead. Let's see here. Okay. My tree is speaking again. My tree says to Vidura, Kardama said this much only and then became silent, thinking of the Lord. As he smiled silent, as he silently smiled, his face captured the mind of Devahuti, who, be, who began to meditate upon the great sage. So we see the attraction between the couple. So text 22 describes the emperor gladly gave his daughter to the sage whose host of virtues was equaled by hers. Emperor Shatarupa lovingly gave valuable presents, jewels, clothes, household articles in dowry to the bride and bridegroom. And Prabhupada talks about that. It's customary. Couple get married. Then the girl is the girl's parents are giving so many presents to help them to take up householder life. And Swayambhuva Manu, text 24, he is relieved of his responsibilities, his mind ag agitated by feeling of separation, embraced his affectionate daughter with both his arms. And so the daughter is very dear to the father. Just as the son is very dear to the mother, the daughter is always dear to the father. And so the emperor was unable to bear the separation of his daughter, and tears poured down from his eyes again and again, drenching his daughter's head as he cried, My dear mother, my dear daughter. So, so much loving affection, the father very attached to his daughter, and he's, although he's got sons, he's got three daughters, but this one, obviously, very dear to him. And he's leaving her there in that ashram in the forest. And then Swambhuvamana takes permission to leave. And we're told along the way, Swambhuvamana sees the different hermitages, that there are other great sages all living on the banks of the Saraswati, the Saraswati, that's not visible today, Saraswati River. And then we hear about Swayambhuva Manu going back to his own abode, to his own kingdom, to Brahmavarta. Manu has his own residence there. Brahmavarta is called Barishmati. And it the emperor lives there with all of his arishmati, that it's important in relation to Lord Varaha. It said the hairs from Lord Varaha drop from the, his body, first came from the body of Lord Varaha, that grew as kusha grass. And kusha grass is what the Brahmana rituals to the Lord. They will use the kusha and kasha grass, which came from the body of Lord Varaha. So now we're going to hear about Swayambhuva Manu's life here in Barishmati. What does he do there? How does he live? His Manu, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't just live a life of sense gratification. His Manu, he's a great devotee. And he's very, he's very dedicated to his uh, service to the Lord. He has, he has to rule the globe, but at the same time, he has to also worship the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada in the purport, he makes the point about some, somebody may have a lot of wealth. You know, some people have very good karma and they get a lot of wealth, they have a very good birth, 
the beautiful bodies and wonderful education, the best education. So this is possible. Uh, sometimes people may have that without the mercy of the Supreme Lord. Those who are in possession of such valuable facilities must acknowledge their gratefulness to the Lord by worshipping Him and offering what they have received from Him. So there's no harm in somebody being born in an opulent condition, surrounded with wealth and luxury and beauty and so on, but we should recognize these things are the gift of the Supreme Lord, and we should use them in the service of the Lord. We shouldn't just think a life of sense gratification. We have to be careful. We want to be happy and peaceful. We have to use everything for the service of the Lord. Then only we can actually be happy and peaceful. If we try to use it for our sense gratification, we'll never be happy, we'll never be peaceful. That is a fact. We know lust burns like fire and is never satisfied. So we have to be very careful how to use everything. And so we hear about Manu enters into his city and Manu lives a long life, right? What's the, what's the duration of Manu's life? 72 or years. 70, 71, is it? million years. 72 years. Or 71. 71, yeah. 71 what? Divya Yuga. Divya Yuga, yes, right. And how long is a Divya Yuga? For 32 billion years. One Divya, one Divya Yuga is? 43 lakh, 20,000. Yes, 43 lakh, 4 million, 320,000 years. A Kali Yuga is 432,000 years. And one Divya Yuga is ten times the duration of Kali Yuga. So add another nothing onto the back or onto the end of 432,000 and becomes 4,320,000. And then that's one Divya Yuga and Manu lives for 71 Divya Yugas. And how many Manus are in one day of Brahma? 14 Manus. 14 Manus, right. So, this is Manu enters into the, the palace filled with an atmosphere which is uh, very spiritual. There's no influence of the modes of nature. His palace is really, really transcendental abode. Prabhupada explains, because the miseries of material existence affect people in Krishna. You know, we see be, being a devotee, we shouldn't think that because we're devotees there will be no miseries. Of course, even Manu, Manu enters the palace, you know, it's so luxurious. Does it mean there's no misery there? No, he just, he just left his daughter in the forest there. So that pain of separation is there. So Prabhupada explains here, it's an important point here, the purport of text number 32. Prabhupada said, uh, the miseries of material existence cannot affect the status of Krishna consciousness. It is not that the miseries of the material world completely vanish when one takes to Krishna consciousness. But for one who is Krishna conscious, the miseries of material existence have no effect, right? We cannot stop the miseries of the material atmosphere, 
But Krishna consciousness is the antiseptic method to protect us from being affected by the miseries of material existence. It's a very important quote there, right? Krishna consciousness is the antiseptic uh, method to protect us from the miseries of material life. Miseries will still be there, but they don't have any effect just if, we, if we are Krishna conscious. All right. You have any experience of that? Have you experienced transcending the miseries of material life? We're going to hear about Swayam Bhuvamanu. He says, how Swayam Bhuvamanu created an atmosphere wherein he was not affected by material miseries is explained in the following verses. Right? We want to, do, you, do you want to have an atmosphere in your home where you're not going to be affected by material miseries? You have to follow Swayam Bhuvamanu's example. It's all described here in Srimad Bhagavatam, right? How to do it? Well, it's mentioned here. What did he do? Emperor Swayambhuva Manu enjoyed life with his wife and subjects and fulfilled his desires without being disturbed by unwanted principles contrary to the process of religion. Celestial musicians and their wives sang in chorus about the pure reputation of the emperor. And early in the morning, every day, he used to listen to the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead with a loving heart. So these are some of the things which we have to do. And Prabhupada goes into detail about it in the purport. He talks about how having Shanai played in the morning and people singing. You know, here, here in Mayapur, we used to have Shanai players also play. I don't know what happened, but they used to come here, particularly at the time Gaur Purnima, and they would be here, they'd be playing. It's a very wonderful, powerful instrument the sound of the Shanai. It's more popular in South India than in North India. But uh, Swayambhuva Manu's palace is mentioned there. And then, the, so there'd be musicians, there'd be singing, and they would sing songs. Sometimes they'd sing about the emperor, and sometimes they'd think, sing about the glories of the Lord. And then there would be also recitation, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. These things would all be discussed. And Prabhupada talks about Mongol Arti. Many people get up, go to Mongol Arti. Just like in Jaipur, go to the temple in Jaipur and see the deities. People will go there 4.30 in the morning every day. They'll be there and they'll see Radha Govinda. Not only Radha Govinda, the many temples, Mongolati, many people. Here in Mayapur, Radha Madhava, many people come every morning. So this is how to make our life free of the miseries of material existence. We just have to be Krishna conscious and we won't be affected. Isn't it a fact? Yes, my mm. So, going ahead. Uh, Text 34, Swayambhuva Manu was a saintly king. 
although absorbed in material happiness, he was not dragged to the lower grade of life, for he always, he always enjoyed the material happiness in a Krishna conscious atmosphere. Swambhuvamanu was considered as good as a saintly sage because the atmosphere created in his kingdom and home was completely Krishna conscious. And we, we do see some devotees, you know, you go to their home and it's very Krishna conscious. You know, the deities there and the deities being worshipped. Whatever is cooked is offered to the deity. And so this way, the devotees are living fully in Krishna consciousness. Playing wonderful kirtan, hearing the chanting of the holy name. So Prabhupada said here, the Krishna Consciousness Movement can give the people in general the best opportunity to utilize the human life in the midst of material enjoyment. So we're not, we're not against material enjoyment. Actually, Krishna is the greatest enjoyer. Krishna likes to enjoy more than anybody. So we don't want to stop enjoying, but we want to give people spiritual enjoyment, not mundane sense gratification. Material happiness on the spiritual platform, chanting of the holy name, nice kirtan, and reading from Prabhupada's books, very important for all of us. So, Manu had a long life, but gradually came to an end. Everyone's life, even you'll live a long time, some, it will come to an end. So, he was, he, he didn't pass his time in vain. He was always engaged, hearing, contemplating, writing down, chanting the pastimes of the Lord. So, this is the business of devotees. We do all of these different activities, chanting, reading, writing, try to write something. Prabhupada said, even you don't get it published, doesn't matter. But the, it's, a, it's the engagement for the mind, to use our mind to write, to describe the glories of Krishna, and to write about the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada said, the life of Emperor Swayambhuvamanu, however, was not tasteless as he grew older. His life remained so f as fresh as in the beginning because of his continued Krishna consciousness. So we, we see old people, what do old people do in material society? They sit and watch television all day, they read the newspapers, and they play cards, and they sleep. They do nothing. They don't know how to use their life. But Swayam Bhuvamanu, he's showing <coughs> his life is not tasteless. He's getting the greatest pleasure. He passed his time in the long life, always engaged in matters regard, regarding Vasudev. Thus he transcended the three destinations. What are the three destinations? It, uh, Dharma, Artha, and Kama. Mm, well, are they? The three destinations? Bur Bhuvaswa. Bur Bhuvaswa, yes. I think that's more likely, yeah. Bur, Bhuva, and Swa. 
surpass those. God uh, wants to get out the material world, at least go to the top of the material world. So, doesn't want to get stuck in the material world. It may also be the modes of nature, the three destinations surpass the de surpass the mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance. So it's mentioned, though, that although Swayambhuva Manu was the ruler of the material world, he appeared to be Maharaj, yes. In the purport, uh, starting there are the three destinations described when you read in the beginning and said these are the three stages of consciousness. Oh, that's right. Sleeping, deep sleep, and uh, awake. Right. That's one explanation, but there was other explanation also. There were different explanations given. All right. And then uh, Prabhupada talks that Swayambhuva Manu is not in the mode of goodness or passion or ignorance, but he's always transcendentally situated because he's absorbed in the service of the Lord. So he's free from the influence of the modes of nature. And Pram Prabhupada talks about he's always on the Brahma Buddha platform. How can persons completely under the shelter of Lord Krishna and devotional service be put into miseries pertaining to the body, the mind, nature, and other men and living creatures? And so, Swayambhuva Manu has nothing to do with the material world. He taught the diverse sacred duties of men in general and the different varnas and ashrams. So, Maitreya speaking, I have spoken to you of the wonderful character of Swayambhuva Manu, the original king whose reputation is worthy of description. Please hear as I speak of the flourishing of his daughter Devahuti. So that's uh, the next topic, next chapter we'll hear about the, the, the life of Devahuti and her lamentation, of course, with her husband leaving. And then we will hear Kapila Shiksha. So that's what's remaining in this third canto. Chapter 25 is beginning Kapila Shiksha. So we have chapter 23, we'll cover 23 tomorrow. We'll hear about uh, Devahuti's lamentation. And then chapter 24, Kadama's renunciation. And you'll hear about the appearance of Lord Kapila there. In chapter 24, Lord Kapila appears. And then chapter 25, you have Kapila Shiksha, the first chapter. All right, are there any questions on this chapter, chapter 22, Marriage of Kardama and Devahuti? Yes, uh, there is a question that how, what is the, what are the qualities and activities of the citizens of Barismati uh, that we can apply in our own lives? But uh, there is not so, so much mention about all these, uh, the citizens of uh, Barismati. Well, so well, no, it's, it's there, and yeah, about... What did Swayambhuva Manu do? He heard and chanted, yeah, yeah. he heard and yeah. chanted, and he wrote, and he absorbed his mind in remembering the pastimes of the Lord. And he had yeah. people doing kirtan, and they were playing shanai and singing the glories of the Lord. 
So yes, it was a very Krishna conscious atmosphere. Just like you go to some people's homes, you know, they will have Prabhupada chanting box. You hear Prabhupada yeah. chanting japa in one room, and you go in another room. There's a kirtan going on, a recording kirtan somewhere from Vrindavan, 24-hour kirtan, wonderful kirtan. And, you know, like there's many houses, homes like that, very Krishna conscious. They have pictures of Vrindavan and pictures of Govardhan Hill and beautiful deities, beautiful altars. You know, Jaipataka Swami Maharaj is often visiting different homes because he has many disciples. So he takes advantage of Zoom to go and visit different homes on, on, on Zoom. And he'll, he'll go and visit and he'll always ask them, where's your altar? Let me see your deities. And they will open the deities and they'll show their altar to Jaipadaka Maharaj and you'll see how they're worshipping their deity. He'll be interested, he's always interested to see that. And so it's different in different places, you know, some places it's not so easy to get flowers. Some parts of the world it's still snowing just now, you know, so it's really difficult some parts of the world to get flowers and to decorate it. But still, you can keep the Krishna conscious atmosphere wherever we are, heaven or hell or liberation. It's all the same for the devotee. Wherever they go, their business is the same, to chant and to hear and to remember Krishna, to discuss topics of Krishna in the association of devotees. They have no other business. So this is what's going on in Barishmati. This is what the people are doing. They go to the Mongol Arti, they see the deities every day. That was also described. Prabhupada talked about that, going to see the deities. Prabhupada talked about that one family in Kanpur, Singhania, J.K. Singhania, that they have a Krishna temple. And if they, if they don't go to see the deity, then the, the person in charge of the temple will come and tell them, there's a fine, you have to pay the fine. And everyone will pay the fine. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry I didn't come, I'll pay the fine. So that's the system in their family, that everyone, every day, they must go to see the deity, otherwise they will be fine. And Prabhupada said also to devotees, you go to Mongol Arti, if you don't go to Mongol Arti, you must distribute one Krishna book. If you don't go to the Mongol Arti, you must distribute a Krishna book. Prabhupada said, that's a fine for the devotee. <laughs> okay? Yes, Maharaj. <clears throat> Any other questions? Just want to ask one question. I don't know. Like how Manu's lifespan was uh, like seventy-one cycle of the four yugas, but Devo Devo's lifespan is not that right. Not that. that. Devo Huti's life. How long? Life lifespan is not that. Like as like as Manu's lifespan, right? Yes, yes, I, yeah, we don't know, and I don't know about Devotee's life, but of course it's Satya Yuga, so everyone's living quite a long life, you know, every, the lifespan is people generally in Satya Yuga was 100,000 years. Yeah, like, but, uh, like, 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 how Manu's is uh, his lifespan was way more bigger uh, than the people in Satya Yuga. Because like it's like uh, seventy-one times, not more than that. Yeah. But Devoti was uh, daughter of Manu, but uh, like, and, um, her her was not that big, not that large. Right. Yeah. We don't we don't know exactly how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, she she did uh, she did have a a good life. She travelled around with her husband, they travelled around for many years and then they came back and then they had children and then after her husband left, then she also lived a long time, she was there. 
doing her doing her meditation she was remembering her son and she was feeling the affection for her son feeling the separation from Lord Kapila and so it said Devahuti later on you read Devahuti she actually transforms into a, a river she became a river and that river is still flowing there Where, in, it's in Gujarat, I'm told. Okay. That is, uh, that Bindu is also there. Is there? No, I think Bindu is in Vrindavan, isn't it? But, uh, oh, the place where Kardama Muni, yeah, yes, Devahuti, that, uh, that is in, uh, well, it said, and I'm told it's over in Gujarat. I don't know exactly where in Gujarat, but I'm told it's somewhere over there. Okay. It, it's mentioned there's a place where her body transformed into water. It's called yeah. uh, Siddha, the, Siddhapada. Siddha, yes, ma'am. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Kapil Dev is still now living. He's in uh, that uh, Ganga Sagar. Uh, that, uh, yes, that Kapila point. Muni is still there. He resides eternally there at Ganga Sagar. Right. You know, living a long life is not so desirable. You know, Markandeya Rishi, he got the blessing he could live through a night of Brahma, and he th found it to be a lot of trouble. <laughs> It's a lot of trouble when there was a great devastation and the night of Brahma and for a long time he was just tossed about in the ocean of devastation. It was terrible for him. And so, you know, we, we don't envy these people who have a long life, have to live here in the material world a long time, you know. Oh, must be very difficult. That is my question. Maharaj. So why Devati is such an elevated, elevated devotee and who gave birth to Krishna, I mean Kapila Muni, then how come she is not liberated and she is still in this material world? Well, she is liberated. She is liberated. She went to Kapila Vaikuntha. There's a planet in Vaikuntha where she went in her spiritual body. But her physical form transformed into a river. But she herself, the spiritual part, the spiritual form, she went back to Godhead, to Kapila Vaikuntha. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. It's difficult for us to understand because material, uh, I mean, uh, like in uh, Dhruva Maharaj's case, we see that he actually goes with his own body. So, you know, and when he hears, like, they have two separate um, material bodies still existing and the spiritual body goes back. It's really difficult people like, for people like me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question or comment? Okay, then we'll finish here tonight and we'll be back tomorrow night to do Devahuti's Lamentation. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Yeah.